Okay, I'm back with part two of my uh, in-depth explanation about aircraft in War in the Pacific. Um, in this video, I'm going to talk a little bit, or start out by talking about some of the options available to your air groups. So I'll pop open um, the aircraft menu for, or airbase menu, for one of my West Coast groups. Um, and, yeah, the Stauntless Squadron will do just fine. Uh, CC. I'm going to set it to naval attack, and I'll talk a little bit about some of these options that you see here. Um, the first is, you might notice when you set patrol levels for anti-sub and uh, search, you get a start and an end, and this indicates the uh, the search arcs. So let's go up to your, here at the uh, in the legend, and it'll kind of show you it's uh, starts at zero and ends at 359. So it's basically you know your general. 360 degree circle. Uh, zero is north, 90 is east, 180 is south, and 270 degrees is west. And you can see that by um, set training to zero. Let's uh, fill this group with pilots. It's always a plus, like I mentioned uh, how to do last video. And set 50% anti sub, 50% search. Let's say anti sub to uh, 270 degrees to 0 degrees and let's set search to 0 degrees to 90 degrees and see what happens. So notice some arcs show up. It's kind of hard to see um, especially over the land but um, basically um, each of these arcs represents a single plane and uh, I kind of chose a bad example because there's so many planes in this group. You see, um, these arcs are fully covered in both AM and PM. Uh, if they aren't, you'd see like half of them be green, the other half be blue. Uh, that means like the blue half is either AM or PM, and the green half is whatever the other is. Because <clears throat> you know, smaller number of planes than 36. Um, you know, like if you have a squadron of eight. Catalinas or something, they can only cover a certain amount of uh, ocean in a day. So that's how um, search arcs work, but as of uh, this recording, the official patch um, that's the latest official version, um, the search arcs are kind of broken, I don't really know how, so I generally don't set any arcs at all and then it kind of randomizes them. Um, but the latest, there's a beta patch out there that if you uh, if you install that then search arcs work correctly so that's uh, that's something to keep in mind um, next thing is altitude bands um, for dauntlesses um, or in any dive bomber in general you have the dive bombing band between 10 and 15 thousand feet the glide bombing band between 16 and 20 thousand feet and then everything else is normal um, Let's keep them in the dive bombing band because that's best for dive bombers. Uh, glide bombing is kind of useful if you want to preserve airframes but want to sacrifice accuracy a little bit. Um, and then there's a special type of bombing. Let's see if I can find some. Yeah, here we go. B-25G's medium attack level bomber. Um, attack level bombers are very well suited for something called skip bombing. So you set its mission naval attack and set its altitude to anything less than a thousand feet. I usually just stick it at a thousand because why not? And um, then they'll attack, uh, they'll try and skip bomb enemy ships and it's very very accurate um, and it's very very useful. And it's a good use of medium bombers early in the war especially for the Allies because um, you know as an Allied player you're probably very jealous of the Japanese Bettys which can uh, wreak havoc on shipping and um, B-25s and B-26s early on doing doing skip bombing is a pretty good um, pretty good answer to that. You can also set four engine bombers to do that too, but a lot of uh, a lot of players actually set a gentleman's agreement if they're doing a player versus player uh, to not use their four engine bombers for that because apparently it's really really powerful. I've not tried it just for historical accuracy reasons. Ah yes, and uh, the final tidbit here is uh, secondary missions. So you notice when you're set to naval attack, 
you get a second mission up here. And it's only naval attack, so... Uh, well, naval attack and training, but training comes later. Naval attack, you get a secondary mission, airfield, port, ground attack, or recon, or rest. Um, if a group on naval attack doesn't find any naval targets, um, at the end of the afternoon air phase, it'll carry out its secondary mission, so it'll attack any airfield in range, or you can actually even assign it to attack one. So there you go. Um, next thing, this group was originally training, so let's talk about how training works a little bit, because it's really unintuitive, and I'll try and uh, shed some light. So, here are the default values for training for bombers, um, and the default values are pretty rubbish. Um, so all bombers get set to airfield attack, and at a patrol level of 40. Well, first off, why do we want to only train part of the time? Let's train all the time. And the second is, why are, you know, dive bombers training in airfield attack? They're better suited to anti-shipping, so let's, you need to change that to naval attack. Now that's optional, um, you know, do what you want. Um, and then the final thing is, a new air group that arrives will be set at its extended radius. Um, that increases operations losses, and when you're training, you don't need to uh, be going anywhere, so set maximum range to zero. It'll just kind of train over its own airbase and uh, get experience that way. So that's the best way to set up training. Um, check out some results of training, you can open up the pilot's menu. You see a bunch of things here. Um, training experience generally caps around 70 because nothing's better than practical experience, obviously. And you see all these uh, different types of experience like air, Nave B, Nave T, and so on. Um, air is air to air. Nave B is naval bombing, Nave T is naval torpedoing. Low in is low naval attack, low G is low ground attack, and that's strafe, that's defense, so um, the rest are pretty self-explanatory. Um, some of these don't really correspond to any of the training missions you can give, so I'll talk about those a little. First off, Nave T is a torpedo bomber group set to train at, uh, with naval attack with torpedoes armed. Uh, these aren't torpedo bombers, so I can't really show that off, but... That's, uh, that's how you increase Nave T. Uh, low in, low G, and strafe is dependent on both mission and altitude. So low in is naval attack, training at low altitude, 100 feet's fine. Uh, low G is any of these three others. And strafe, I think, is a fighter group set to sweep at 100 feet. Um, let's see... And yeah, that's all there is on training that I can think of. Um, so next thing I'll talk about is headquarters units. What do they do? Well, I mentioned earlier they uh, e they make it easier to upgrade air groups by uh, you don't need as by not forcing those air groups to require as large of an air base to upgrade. They have some other benefits too. Well, aside from the obvious uh, providing a ton of aviation support. Um, one thing they do is um, they can kind of increase the airfield capacity. I mentioned that rule of thumb of, um, you know, airbase size, like the number of size of your airbase is the number of air groups you can carry. So a level four airbase can have four groups. For a headquarters group, you can add the command radius to that. So say you have a level four airbase, command radius is five, uh, four plus five is nine. Now you can support nine air groups. Really, really useful. Um, also, it can kind of magically get in replacement aircraft. So if a base has 20,000 supply, and you have a space next door that doesn't have 20,000 supply, um, the headquarters can get in replacements and then ship them over to the other base. So that's pretty useful, too. Um, and also, it's obviously best if uh, so there's this 14th U.S. Army Air Force, that's the headquarters unit. It's best if most of your planes there are in the same same command. And you can change that by opening the group, attach to, and then selecting in this big long menu. It costs some political points, but by the time you actually need to uh, optimize that much, then it's uh, political points generally aren't that big of a thing anymore. Um, 
Next thing you might want to know is how do you move your groups? Um, the first obvious answer is just fly them from base to base. And that's pretty easy to do. You open your group, say transfer to base, and can select it from the list or select it on the map. Um, the second thing you can do is ship them, so you create a, any kind of transport task force. But I, I usually make air transport just so it's uh, easy for me to see um, what type of um, cargo I'm expecting the task force to have. Tell it to load troops and select your air group and send it off to its destination. Um, AKVs can transport air groups and not take apart the planes but otherwise uh, any other cargo ship will put the planes in boxes. They'll have to be uh, maintained or repaired or something once they get to their destination. So that's kind of important to note. Um, also if you want to uh, transfer planes from base to base just by flying, you need to pay attention to this maximum range value. This is 11 hexes. That's uh, as far as it can go. But sometimes you can give a plane drop tanks, which will take this one from a transfer range of 14 to 26 hexes. So adds a lot of options to you. Um, also, if you have a staging base, say you want to go from Sydney to Port Moresby, but you can't fly all the way there in one go, you might want to stage at Townsville. You should make sure that Townsville has some aviation support because um, sometimes planes get damaged on transferring uh, by air. So you need to patch that up before you transfer the rest to Port Moresby. Um, and finally, um, you might ask once, uh, once your first group withdrawals come up, I can't withdraw my group, what is wrong? Uh, the answer is some perma per permanently restricted groups only give you the option to disband them. Uh, disbanding does the same thing as withdrawing in terms of saving your political points, but the planes and pilots don't get re-added to your pools. So they kind of get lost. Um, so I'll see if I can find one. Yeah, this is a group where you can only disband it. The withdraw group option is grayed out, and it tells you when you need to withdraw. Um, for groups like this, I find training to be kind of pointless. I just didn't set this one right. So these permanently restricted groups are kind of best used to do some basic combat air patrols and stuff around your west coast bases. Um, and the second reason you might not be able to withdraw a group is the group might be fragmented. Um, so how might this happen? Uh, if you transfer a group from base to base, this squadron's a good example, you see it's got eight, eight aircraft serviceable and four that are undergoing maintenance. Um, and if you try and transfer, the group's going to be split up because the plane's being maintained, they can't fly. So they, uh... Normally they'll rejoin the group automatically once they get fixed up, and the game will tell you that. Um, but if you kind of ignore the last piece of advice I gave, which was uh, if, you use a, if you use a staging base, make sure it has aviation support. If you, um, a group might get stuck there if, uh, if it doesn't have aviation support to repair it um, before its second leg of the flight, or second leg of the transfer. So uh, that's another way a group can be split up. Actually, I'm going to demonstrate one thing really quick. That is taking the squadron, transferring it to uh, just, I don't know, Wheaton's Org, why not? And now, now that it's split up, you see this unit order of battle screens active, and it'll tell you where each chunk of the group lives. So there you go. Um, and that's how you hunt down wayward groups like that. So there you go, there's some intermediate info about aircraft in War in the Pacific. I hope this kind of helps you out, um, and evens the gap between you and your AI opponent who's you know, perfect at anything involving logistics. And I hope it also uh, kind of makes the game seem a little less complex now that I've explained the complexity. Um, if you have any questions, once again, please post them in the comments, I'll address them as best I can. and. Um, if you have any additional information you'd like to share, also comment that. Thanks for watching. I'll be back uh, in a little bit with some more uh, intermediate tutorials on War in the Pacific. Thanks for watching.